what I want you to do more than anything else, Crawford, is resolve the issues around you. Don't let issues fester. Don't let offenses fester. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. That's what Paul meant by that. You know, take care of your relational business. Keep the ball on the other side of the net. No, you're not responsible for what they think about you, but you got to get the issues off your plate. You go after those things. You address those issues. Go after them. Don't avoid them. Don't hide them. Don't be passive aggressive about them. Go after those issues. And so he's talking about proactively pursuing peace. You got somebody that has an issue with you? Go find them. You got an issue with somebody? Don't spiritualize it. Go take care of it. He says, run down peace. And by the way, the peace here, he's not talking about passivity. Notice again, strive for peace. You're going to take action to get peace. This is not to be viewed as, you know, um, I just want to be a peacekeeper. No, you want to be a peacemaker. Go after that. The second word that he uses here is that we're to strive for holiness. Holiness. Now, contextually, what he's talking about here, this is, this is so that you know that the peace that he's talking about is not some little nirvana nonsense and uh, some, you know, this crazy kind of feeling here. But when he says strive for holiness here, I really believe in context what he's talking about is the removal of sin in relationships. He's talking about the removal of sin in relationships. He's talking about going to a brother and, and confronting him about sin. Taking care of the sin in your own heart and life. Challenging one another about what we do in our mouths and the loose things that we say and the gossip and the attitudes and the harsh words that come out of our mouths. He said, go after holiness. Go after holiness. Go after holiness. And one of the reasons why, by the way, parenthetically, I really believe that God is withholding revival from the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is that we don't do church discipline well. We don't want the hassles associated with that. We don't want people poking their lips out at us. We don't want folks not putting the money in the offering. We don't want people leaving the church. And we don't want any of that stuff. And so what we do is that we kind of wink at it. We kind of let it go. We kind of like assume that it's not happening. And we do that with people that we love. We love the relationship more than we love the individual. And you should always love the person more than you love the relationship. And whenever you love the relationship more than you love the person, you will be a coward. Because if you really love someone, you will tell them the truth. The Bible does not call us to a passive love. It does not call us to this pampering love. It does not call us to a love that is afraid. It calls us to a courageous love. That I love you too much that even if you don't like me, I've got to tell you the truth. So he says, go after holiness. And thirdly, he says, strive for grace. Grace. I love the way he positions this in the opening clause of verse 15. He says, see to it that no one fails <laughs> to obtain the grace of God. Crawford, anybody that's around you should sense the love and the mercy of Jesus. I love the way he couches this. The going after holiness is not a condescending self-righteousness. But it's done with grace. Realizing that you have failed and I have failed and that Jesus has put us all back together. And that anybody that comes within your environment, they ought to feel the grace, the love, and the mercy, the mercy of God. Now all of that sets up bitterness. If you do not intentionally go after peace, if you do not intentionally go after holiness, if you do not 
intentionally extend grace, bitterness will be your environment. Bitterness will be your experience. Now let me say a few words about bitterness. And then I want to talk about six signs of bitterness. And then I want to come back to the passage. Okay? After he says this, he warns us that no root of bitterness. Root of bitterness. What is bitterness? Rather than a clear definition, let me just sort of describe it. I, I think we all know what it is. I would say that bitterness is the effect of wounds that have not been attended to. That's bitterness. The truth of the matter is we all get hurt. And just by virtue of the fact that you've been hurt doesn't mean that you're bitter. We all are hurt. We all are hurt. You got a spiritual split second before you go down that path to bitterness. You got to decide what you're going to do about the hurt. But the fact that you've been hurt does not necessarily mean that someone's bitter. And be careful of calling someone's bitter, someone bitter if they're just hurt and they're weeping or they're, they feel the pain or they, 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 they're angry. To be angry doesn't necessarily mean that you're bitter. But you got to be careful. If you don't get into the verb position with, what, with your offenses, you will become bitter. They are wounds that have not been attended to. They, 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 they're festering, unforgiven offenses. You keep taking laps in your mind about what happened to you. You just keep revisiting that in your head. You start dreaming about what you should have said and could have said. And if this ever happens again, what I will do and how I can un unravel all of this. And I tell you what, I tell you what, nobody's going to mess over me again. <laughs> you know, wait till I see them. You laugh because you feel it. <laughs> Bitterness is the infection of the heart. It's a bad thing. It's a, it's a bad thing. It's a bad thing. It's the infection of the heart. And we'll see this in a few moments. The bad thing about bitterness is that it gets woven into our character, and that's dangerous. It's the infection of the heart. I, I, I was up in Cleveland speaking at an event and uh, with some Christian leaders, and um, this man came up. To me and his wife was in a wheelchair and I, I noticed that she had lost her leg just below her knee and uh, they told me this incredible story she said you know this is all so very unnecessary I said what yeah she said let me tell you what happened I had a, just something more than a scratch but it really wasn't all that serious on my shin. And, uh, you know, I didn't pay much attention to it, just dealt with it topically and, you know, just went on about my business. Well, it got a little infected. And at that moment, I should have gone to the doctors, but I felt like I could still deal with this thing. Well, it got worse because somehow or another, it was a lot deeper and more pervasive under the skin than she realized. And then one morning she wakes up, her whole leg is inflamed and red and swollen. And finally she goes to the hospital and the doctor says, we can't save your leg. It's festering in your heart. And you're saying, oh, it's nothing. It's just, yeah, okay, I'll deal with that. What's festering in there? You know, I'm so burdened about this because I have met people who are enormously gifted with great abilities, great talent, great insight, but they haven't gone too far because they, they're just infected people. Angry and not dealing with their hurts. And you look at them and you say, my goodness, who hurt them? I don't want to shoot the messenger here, 
but nobody's responsible for my bitterness but me. Bitterness is deceptive and seductive. It, it doesn't really want justice. It seeks revenge. That's when you know that you're kind of bitter. It's not that you want to resolve an issue. You want to straighten somebody out. You know, I, I was called into several years ago. Oh, boy, this was a humdinger, man. I, I was called into sort of like uh, be a peacemaker between two Christian leaders, all right? And they were ticked off at each other. I mean, that's a mild expression. And so we're meeting in this conference room, and, and they're on either side. And, you know, these guys, I tell you, if I mention their names, some of you, you would know who they are. It, is, it was absolutely embarrassing. As they were flying right back at each other, I thought I was listening to two junior high school boys upset that they got cut from the team or something. And they were just hurling stuff back and forth. At one point, honestly, I thought they were going to throw hands. And the irony is, when I talked to both of them before I got there, they said, no, we want to reconcile. We want you to come and hear this. And, this guy. and I, in the middle of this, I said, hey, stop it, stop it, stop it. You guys don't want reconciliation. You want vindication. That's what you want. You, you want me to say, hey, look, you're an idiot, and he's right. <laughs> and that's the point at which you, you can get so upset about what has happened to you that reconciliation is taken off the table because you don't want to be reconciled. You want them to pay for it. You want everybody to know, no, don't you ever invite him to speak at that thing. Uh-uh, no, no, don't give him a job over at that church. You know what he did to me? No, no, don't you say... How do we know when we're bitter? What are the signs of bitterness? I want to give you six of them, but I have to say, admittedly, uh, neither, any, none of these things in and of themselves would necessarily say that you're bitter, you're bitter, but they're good signs that you might be heading down that path. The first sign is this. When you start recruiting others to take up your issues, You know, when you start sharing with folks, I love what our brother said last night about prayer requests. We laughed at that, but I tell you, we've all been in them meetings. Brother, I just want to let you know, I just want to share this with you. I share my heart with you about so and so. And, you know, this, I just want you to be holding him up in prayer, you know. He's just sort of, you know, just lift him up. No, you're, you're recruiting. That's what you're doing. You're recruiting. You don't want them praying. You want them P-R-E-Y-I-N-G, but you don't. You know, when you start recruiting people. Second one, which is really a biggie, is anger. Anger. I think that's the core response when you're bitter. That's the one that I have to watch out for. When, when I am... I can't handle my anger and put it in perspective on an individual. I, I got to be careful of that one. Anger. You just think of that person and you spit and man. Thirdly, another indication is unhealthy, unbalanced confrontation. And it's not necessarily with that person, but somebody that reminds you of that person. You ever seen people who are just kind of like shooting cannons at canaries? You, you know what I mean? It's just sort of like they're over the, over, overboard with something. It just, you know, they say, ooh, that, there's a message in that thing. I mean, you know, he just spilt his milk. Don't send him, put him on punishment for seven years. <laughs> Thirdly, when you're obsessed by hurt or injustice. When you're obsessed with it. You, you can't think straight. You can't put it in perspective. That's the word. When you can't put the issue in perspective, you cannot emotionally let it go. You may be bitter at that point. It is crossed over. Uh, and bitterness is an insidious form of idolatry, by the way. 
It's a very subtle, insidious form of idolatry because you are controlled by that issue. And you just can't put it in its right place. Obsession sets in. Number five is what I call fear and flight. These are people who typically are passive aggressive in their personalities. Um, they don't deal with things directly. And you think that they're very sweet people. And you think they're very nice people. But if you listen to them talk, there's always this little cynicism about them. Little issue. Uh, I, I have a, a lifelong friend of mine. Lifelong friend of mine. Uh, we were at the same organization for a number of years. And uh, this is his profile. And one day I confronted him on it. Because every time we would get together very subtly, very kind of almost sweetly, you know, but very subtly he would kind of like fillet the leadership. You know, just little zingers, no, nothing directly, you know, but there was always this haze. And I remember one day saying, you know what, you're, you're bitter. No, 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 no. And I said, no, yes, you are. You just won't go directly and deal with your issues. And you know enough of the Bible and you have enough of a spiritual tone to make, what your, make your criticism sound palatable. But I've known you for too many years and you keep doing the same thing. I'm too old to do recreational preaching and some of us in here are like that. Now, we don't blow off Bitterness manifests itself in many different ways. We, we, we don't like confrontation. Some of us are conflict averse. But that does not mean that we don't deal with the issue. You might be bitter. Number six is simply you just simply can't face the offender. When they walk in the room, you just, you can't be there. You can't, can't stand to hear their name. Uh, you can't stand to be around them. Uh, any thought of them, uh, you, you, you just can't deal with it. You might be, might be bitter. Okay, let's get back to the text here. So, the idea here. The writer of Hebrews says, I want you to be proactive, Crawford, Crawford, go after peace. Reconcile relationship, Crawford, Crawford, remove sin from your life and from the environment around you. And Crawford, I want you to be a person that extends grace. Now, if you don't do this, here's this root of bitterness. And the text says, here is how bitterness manifests itself in your life. Um, he describes it in verse 15. The very first thing he says, and, and I, please, please forgive me for being so obvious, but I think sometimes the simplicity of the passage is eloquent. Listen to what he says here. Bitterness is beneath the surface. He says that no root of bitterness, root of bitterness. Here, most scholars believe that the writer of Hebrews is quoting Deuteronomy 29, 18. Israel's about ready to go into the land, and he's warning them of, of, of sinful relationships that are beneath the surface. Beneath the surface. It's down there. It's down there. And see, that's the reason why, you know, you can, you can live with bitter people. You can, you can function. You can interact with others. You can compartmentalize. You can act as if nothing is wrong. But the bitterness is beneath the surface. Nobody holds a placard that says, I'm bitter. Nobody does that. But we shove it down. Secondly, he describes um, bitterness as sudden and unpredictable. The text says that no root of bitterness springs up. Springs up. That's how it manifests itself. Now, the manifestation of it is sudden and unpredictable, but it's been there for a while. It's been under the surface for a while. And all of a sudden, one day, 
bam, it just comes out. You know, it's sort of like this time of the year, a little further south, we live down in the Atlanta area, and uh, the grass is starting to turn green, and things are starting to bloom and bud and this sort of thing. And uh, you can go out in a couple of weeks, you go out and cut your grass, it looks so wonderful and clean and all of that. In a few days, you get weeds all over the place. So where'd they come from? Well, they've been down there. They've been down there. Most of the time, people don't all of a sudden have relational breakdowns. The stuff has been there all along. The cracks in the foundation have been there all along. The unresolved issues have accumulated. The anger has built up. And all of a sudden, it just manifests itself. People go off, and they say things. They do nasty things. They write terrible emails. And by the way, don't be so dumb to put your business on the Internet. I read emails sometimes. I'm going, what are these idiots thinking about? Excuse the expression. That's found in the Greek. Um, it, what, what I'm trying to tell you is that there's no such thing as effective compartmentalization. There's no such thing. There's no such thing. Sooner or later, what's in us is going to tell the truth about us. It springs up. Thirdly, it is destructive. It is destructive. That no root of business bitterness springs up and causes trouble. Trouble. That word trouble is a Greek word that means to excite and create a disturbance. Uh, bitterness is a fight waiting to happen. Bitterness is looking for an opportunity. That's the nature of bitterness. It's something has been denied or something has been taken from. And there, there, there is this coddling and nurturing and, and, uh, of, of, of this offense. It's, it's in this incubator that's growing and growing. And given the opportunity, given the right opportunity, it seeks to display itself. And I tell you something, if you're a bitter person, it's not whether or not you're going to cause trouble. You are going to cause trouble. It's just a matter of when. It's a matter of when. And the irony and the tragedy of bitterness is that other people pay for my mess. Buy it. It causes trouble. 